Amper was not allowed to walk freely around Longwood without being accompanied by an English officer that in an area nearly 12 miles square. To guard him, there was a camp at Deadwood, and other at Highsgate, and sentinels without end, cordons of them, around the bound sentry, so close together from nine o'clock in the evening that they could communicate with each other, completely surrounded the house whence no one could go out without being accompanied by an officer, and where no one could enter without permission. The admiral at first forbade anyone to go beyond Hudsgate or to approach Longwood during the day without a permit from the governor, the commander, or himself. He later inaugurated observances which gave an appearance of liberty, being courteous enough, an example followed by all the English, to make application to the Grand Marshal for audiences with the emperor and displaying his relations with the officers of the suite a cordiality which attracted them and allowed them to enjoy magnificent hospitality but he was nonetheless a jailer and a change of watch word of which the emperor had not received notice a misconstructed statement by an officer or a soldier an exaggerated story by a comrade in exile recalled napoleon to reality and respecting the english he had continually to reckon with the anxieties of men infatuated with their responsibilities even at long when an officer of the governor was told off to keep an open eye on the emperor to report upon all his actions to accompany him every time he looked likely to go outside the bounds and to maintain constant communication with plantation house by means of different colored flags hoisted on flagstaff the appearance of blue flag would result in the mobilization of the entire island garrison and patrols would be dispatched in all directions because such a signal would have meant Napoleon has disappeared. The situation was extremely difficult for this officer. If he conscientiously performed his duty, he was bound to a supervision which, if not exactly spying, made life well nigh impossible with those people with whom he was obliged to associate. He shared a table with the emperor's doctor, who was actually an Englishman and an officer in the English service, but others took their meals with him, and he had daily relations with the members of the suite whom he had to accompany or escort whenever they desired to go to Jamestown. The emperor, for his part, feared above all else to resort to trickery. He did not always remain serious. He derived recreation from the least things, playing with children, teasing them and bullying them, and then taking what revenge he could for his captivity by alarming, maddening, and driving his keepers to distraction by making, by word of mouth or in writing outrageous demands of them in which they could not acquiesce without violating their instructions. The game he played with the orderly officer deputed to follow him at a certain distance was to lose him by raising a gallop at a turning in the road and then hiding in some ravine while the officer searched the roads, gave the alarm, and put the whole island in a ferment. He then calmly returned along with what happened was that the officer was instructed to follow at a shorter distance and Napoleon, disgusted at being so closely guarded, gave up horse riding. The ordeal at Longwood was a much more intensive one than that of the Briars. At the Briars, Napoleon regarded himself as a traveler with an incognito. He encamped literally. He had with him no one but Las Casas, who only wanted him to talk so that he might greedily listen to him. No etiquette in one room, eating in it, working and sleeping in it. If any complaints were made by those of the suite left in town, they vanished with them and made no impression. Quite different was the life at Longwood. It was indisputable incarceration here. Napoleon Bonaparte would be confined until he died. That word eternal prison destroyed all hope. All prospect of freedom was swallowed up in the vastness of the seas, which quite apart from the surrounding walls stretched beyond the horizon. This did not, however, mean that all illusion was destroyed for everyone attempted to invent and maintain it in order to please their master. And it was born each morning only to disappear every night leaving merely the bitterness of deception nor did they refrain as soon as a vessel arrived from europe from collecting or inventing news 
which seemed food for rumination, though it was very unlikely and extremely questionable. Everything naturally pointed to an early liberty to a change in the ministry or in the government to a revolution in France to the advent of a vessel to liberate them. And each time these bubbles burst, the confines of the prison seemed narrower. Earlier, the English had announced that Napoleon should reside at St. Helena until his death. Napoleon had asserted that the place of his incarceration was iniquitous, that he was a prisoner only by the abuse of force and had raised his voice in no uncertain manner to protest this upon all occasions and under every circumstance. In the same way, the more the English refused to acknowledge the title which his position warranted, the more vehemently did he claim it. They were locked, demanded of all who had relations with him. With him, it was not a case of vanity influencing him. It was pride, for he had been brought up to the observation of a principle, four times elected by the French nation, consecrated by the Pope, and accordingly in everything Catholic soul, legitimate sovereign, acknowledged as such by all emperors and kings of Europe. His title was indelible, like his coronation. The English swept it away. What had been the empire did not exist for them. With the stroke of a pen, they abolished the national convention, his coronation, and a period of 10 years. Those 10 years from 1804 to 1814, they had never had an emperor, and there was no emperor. I do not know, wrote Admiral Cockburn to General Bertrand, the person whom you titled the emperor. There is no one on this island whom I can consider as having right to such a dignity our respective countries be actually ruled by kings if napoleon allowed himself to be disqualified in this way he would be admitting that everything done by the people was non-existent and that he napoleon was only a rebel further he would admit that he was rightly a prisoner and would submit to captivity he would negative the rights his son and received from him and which he intended at first to maintain for him without doubt he had abdicated his crown but that abdication did not destroy his title he might have been quite prepared if his title had not been disputed to conform to the custom adopted by the majority of non-reigning sovereigns and assume an imaginary and suitable title or name even but this could only be of his own accord and at his own free will no one had the power of forcing it upon him and if this was not an imaginary imaginary name, but the name he had borne before his elevation, the affront became intolerable. This was not, as some have asserted, a childlike affectation. It was firstly concern for his dignity, and secondly, anxiety for his inheritance. It was a claim to the right of a nation, the assertion of the rights of his son. Longwood was but a cottage. Water trickled from the walls down through the rotten floors, and across the ground went hordes of rats. An ordinary English citizen would refuse to furnish it, yet this place was to be the imperial palace. Etiquette would be as rigorously observed as at the Tuileries General would not appear before the emperor except in uniform. No one would remain seated before the emperor. Passing foreigners would not be permitted to pay their respects without a letter of audience presented by the grand marshal. After passing the guardhouse, they must then present themselves to the grand marshal. At the barred gate to Longwood, one of the emperor's servants fulfilled the duties of porter, and sentries had to direct visitors to him that he could inform them whether they would be received. Having reached the house, if they were people of importance, they would find the generals of the emperor's suite full uniform in the waiting room, and they would be conducted to the emperor's study where he would receive them standing and if they did not understand French address them through this cause sometimes even he would enter in the conversation in due course Gorgo picked up enough English to act as interpreter and Bertrand whose wife was English and some of whose children could speak only English soon knew enough to make himself understood the Montsalans ultimately spoke English 
and wants one. By the time he returned to France, found himself a decided Anglomaniac when the visitors were familiar, like the Wilkes, the Skeletons, the Balcons, the Emperor had his carriage prepared and invited the ladies to join him in a drive around the enclosure. Despite the acknowledged skill of the Archambault, the ladies, quite new to such a thrill, were very frightened and not in the least pleased. As to the men, he sometimes took them for a gallop or walked off foot with them around the precincts, but no one sat down in his presence. He gave up the uniform of the light horse, which he most frequently wore, and which he had worn regularly since he left the briars for Longwood, but the attire he assumed in its place, a hunting suit, still presented a certain military appearance. He wore it with a waistcoat and breeches of dimity blue silk stockings and plain shoes with gilt buckles, and those introduced to Longwood had to wear similar dress.